Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. Today I'm joined by Professor of English Literature and Orientalism at the University of Tehran, Mohammed Morandi, to discuss the results of the Iranian presidential elections and some of the simplistic and misleading media portrayals of Iran that have come with that coverage. Mohammed Morandi, welcome. Hi Rania, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to have you on, uh, especially in light of just what just happened. You know, as we're recording this, the U.S. government has just seized, I think, something like 36 mostly Iranian websites in a serious provocation that can only be, I think, understood as an effort to shut down media coverage that challenges the U.S. narrative on Iran. So we're going to get to that. Um, but first, let's talk about some of that coverage, because we've seen a great interest in the Iranian elections in Western media and a great concern for issues like legitimacy and pluralism, you know, conservatives versus reformists. Um, and so hopefully you can help break this down for us. Let's start with basic terms. What does it mean to be a conservative or hardliner or a reformist in Iran? And I ask that because Western media has described the winner of the Iranian presidential elections, uh, Ibrahim Raisi, as a hardliner, among other things. So what does that mean in terms of domestic policy on issues that matter most to Iranians, things like the economy and daily life? And what does that term hardliner mean in terms of foreign policy with the Middle East, the West, and Asia? In truth, hardliner means when American elites and American journalists are not outraged that all these Iranian websites have been uh, taken down by the FBI. And this is a major violation of free speech. And it's basically being done to silence any form of dissent. So that I think is what a real hardliner is. But in the case of Iran, I think a hardliner means in the eyes of Western media, journalists, elites, is a person or people who are opposed to appeasing the United States. So we had a nuclear deal with the Americans and the P5 plus one in general. And uh, Iran gave many concessions. Many in Iran believed it was a very bad deal. Many believed it was fine. Many were somewhere in the middle, but ultimately the Iranians accepted the deal. On the other hand, the Americans, they never implemented the deal. The Iranians fully implemented the deal. Obama never fully implemented the deal. That's what the head of the Iranian Central Bank said during the last days of the Obama presidency. So Obama didn't abide by the deal. Then Trump tore the deal and imposed the maximum pressure campaign again, which was something that Obama started. In other words, targeting Iranian women and children was the Obama uh, idea of diplomacy and of waging war against Iranians. And Trump revived that and took it a step forward. Mm -hmm. So now that Biden has come, even though he criticized Trump and his policy towards Iran, as we speak, he continues to implement Trump's maximum pressure campaign. And what he is trying to do is he's trying to re-enter the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, but he wants to keep some of the sanctions. So he wants Iran to abide by its commitments, but he wants the United States to abide by some of its commitments. The Iranians are saying, no. The Iranians are saying, no, we go to the deal. You implement your side of the bargain and we implement our side of the bargain. This is where Iranians become hardliners. In other words, if they just want what is their right, they've already given concessions to reach the deal. Both sides are supposed to implement the deal. Now one side wants more and it's calling the other side a hardliner. So I think it's pretty clear that hardliner means someone who wants to defend Iran's sovereignty, not to appease an aggressor, and uh, when it's the United States, uh, since it has a powerful media, media they are able to make that the uh, term used at least across 
much of the Western world? Well, so, you know, Western media were also outraged that the Council of Guardians rejected so many candidates ahead of the presidential elections. So can you explain to our listeners and viewers the context behind that? Why did that happen? Why were these uh, candidates rejected? What were the criteria for running? And do you think there was still pluralism in the elections um, in spite of these, I guess, candidates who weren't able to run? Well, the Constitution and the law gives the Guardian Council authority over choosing candidates. It's comprised of 12 people, uh, 12 religious jurists, and uh, sorry, six jurists and six judges. Uh, six are chosen by the, the judiciary and parliament. Six are directly chosen by the leader. This is in the Constitution. Now, there are criticisms of this mechanism, which I personally think are valid. But in any case, this is what's been going on for the last 40 years. And we have had numerous presidential elections, very competitive, and uh, we can still criticize this system, but that's how it is for the time being. Now, the, a, there is a criteria for someone to be able to stand as a candidate for presidency. He has to, or she has to have a certain uh, amount of education. He or she has to have uh, a certain amount of government experience mm -hmm. and, and so on. They have, to, they have to be faithful to the constitution. So usually hundreds of people sign up. Many of them are just there for publicity but ultimately they choose six, seven, eight, ten 10 candidates. Now this time around, there are only two candidates that uh, were serious, that, had, that were well known, that were public figures, uh, that whose applications were rejected. One was Ahmadinejad, the former president, but there was a consensus among reformists uh, principalists, conservatives, or whatever they're called, and moderates that he shouldn't stand for a, for a host of reasons, which uh, I don't think is we have the time for that right now. But the second person was Dr. Larijani. His candidacy was rejected, and I was very surprised, and I think it was a mistake. Now, Dr. Larijani in the council, he got three votes out of 12. No one got all 12 votes, by the way, none of the candidates. But it wasn't like some consensus where some deep state decision was made to make Mr. Raisi the only candidate and that sort of nonsense that we see in the Western media. Uh, because in the council, Mr. Raisi didn't get 12 votes either. And if there was a some decision that Mr. Raisi shouldn't have any real um, person or strong person to stand against him, they could have asked Dr. Larijani not to stand in the first place, and he wouldn't have. But, um, but I think it was a mistake. But his uh, application, his, his request to stand as president um, was rejected. But it's not as if Mr. Raisi had no competition. So we hear in the Western media that you know, there were some unknown people standing against him. The head of the Iranian Central Bank is not an unknown person. So he was one of the two moderate reformist candidates. And on Iranian public television, all the candidates have equal time. Right. So there are three debates, and they all have numerous uh, opportunities to appear on talk shows and they, have, they can create their own videos. And so they all have a large number of uh, programs throughout the uh, period of the um, election campaign. So, and they're all equal. So Mr. Raisi has equal amount of time as the other candidates. The three debates were very hard hitting. The two reformist moderate candidates who were uh, directing their attacks on uh, Dr. Raisi. Dr. Raisi, to be fair, was moderate. He didn't respond. A couple of the 
principalist or conservative candidates, which we could get into what that actually means, uh, they struck back at the reformists. But in any case, it wasn't as if there was no debate. Mm. They were very vicious towards uh, Dr. Racy. They called him uneducated. They said that he's going to bring more sanctions. They said, you know, also they tried to fear monger, which is what they, many people do. Uh, but this was on Iranian public TV. So is this an, was this an ideal election? No. Was this a competitive election? It depends on how you look at it. Because I think that even if Dr. Lari, I, I'm very confident that even if Dr. Lari Jani was allowed to run, he would have had almost zero chance. Why? Because the current administration is very unpopular. And anyone who's associated with this uh, administration, the Rouhani administration, the reformists and the moderates, they really have no chance because people won't vote for them. It's very, I think it's by far the most unpopular administration after the revolution. Dr. Larajani is seen to be close to the administration. Although I personally don't accept that. I don't believe that. I think he has his own views, mm -hmm. but in the public sphere, that's how it's perceived. And the reformists and the moderates had plans to support him. So the polls indicate that he had high negative rates and that because of, of his perceived perception, he's very, he's not popular. I personally you know, like yeah, him, sorry, but in any case, uh, but in any case, uh, so, so that aside, I think Mr. Racy was destined to win. He was very popular during the last year or so. He's been seen as an anti-corruption uh, individual and candidate as the head of the judiciary. He was seen, it was, he was perceived by the public to be successful. And he was, as I said, well ahead in the polls for a very long time. So these seven candidates who remained, they were hard, you know, they were hitting out at each other. Mm -hmm. Is it an ideal election? No. Is it was it competitive? It depends. It was competitive because they all had equal opportunity, but it wasn't because the, the pro-government candidates were destined to be wiped out anyway, no matter who they were. But not ideal, but by no means what the Western media calls it. So Western media also seemed to gloat, and I've seen you respond to this um, on a few different outlets, but Western media seemed to gloat at the lower voter turnout this time around. They kept saying, you know, this is the lowest voter turnout Iran has had since the revolution, um, something like 49%. So to what do you attribute this lower turnout compared to past Iranian elections? And is it possible that the so-called um, middle class was you know, apathetic or not motivated to vote given the candidates who were rejected? Well, a couple of things here. First of all, it wasn't the lowest because last year we had parliamentary elections that were held two days after the first case of coronavirus was discovered and declared in Iran. And that caused a lot of people not to vote. People were pretty scared. This time around, I think the uh, it was like 7% higher than the parliamentary elections that were held back then. According to polls that have been carried out consistently before the election, and I knew that this turnout was more or less correct because polls carried out were indicating that the turnout would be about 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Um, in those polls, it was said that people said between 10 and 12% of people said they won't vote because of the coronavirus. So that is one factor. The second factor is that this current administration made many promises, the outgoing administration. They promised people the moon and they didn't do a good job. They were dealt a very poor hand. They had Trump, and the maximum pressure campaign, they had the coronavirus. They were not, they were unfortunate, but in any case, it was seen as a very incompetent and incapable government, which pursued liberal policies at a time when many people were suffering. And, you know, that made them, that made a lot of people just 
apathetic. So that is another reason. And the third reason is, I think, the, uh, the fact that Mr. Larijani's candidacy wasn't accepted, but I don't think that had a major impact because as I said, he was very unpopular and the head of the central bank who was removed a few weeks ago, but he, he sort of represented the reformist gov uh, government uh, moderate position. Uh, he, he had the opportunity to defeat Mr. Ray, see if, uh, you know, if they had enough supporters support him. If, if people were so adamant that Mr. Raisi shouldn't be president, they would have, they could have rallied around him. So I think there are a number of reasons, but uh, I think it's also important to note that just a few days ago in, in France, they held major and important regional, regional elections. And the turnout was 32%. And the youth apparently turned out at 20%. So if we are going to question legitimacy due to voter turnout, then that would mean that uh, the French Republic is no longer legitimate and now it's a good time to invade. But I'd <laughs> like to just add one thing, and that is in Iran, when in the Western media, they often say the conservatives or ultra conservatives, I don't know where that ultra comes from, but the conservatives in Iran, they, they usually call themselves principalists. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that conservative in Iran doesn't mean the same thing as it does in the West. They are more culturally conservative, but economically, they're leftists. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are many different groups, many small parties, many different factions, and they're not all the same by any means. But on the whole, they're more to the left. The reformists are liberal. They're more liberal relatively speaking, although they have different groups and variations among themselves, uh, different, differing views among themselves. But economically, they're also more liberal. They support capitalism, liberal economics. And the moderates, I would say, are, again, economically liberal. Uh, liberal. They support free markets and capitalism. But uh, culturally, they're somewhere they sort of fluctuate. Again, they're, they're, it's not a monolithic entity, but that's more or less how it is. So it's a different political environment than in Western countries. Now, I'm glad you, you laid that out because it's super important to understand. I'm curious, you know, uh, Raisi was elected as was widely predicted, which you alluded to. Is that important? Uh, the fact that it was widely predicted he would win and then he did win? Well, the polls were constantly indicating that he was well ahead. And no matter how harsh the attacks on him were during the debates, and, the, and in previous elections, we've had regular upsets. Mr. Rouhani himself was not expected to win. Before him, Mr. Ahmadinejad was not expected to win. Before him, Mr. Khatami wasn't expected to win. Before Mr. Khatami, we never had competitive presidential elections, except for uh, the first presidential election. And the reason was because of the war and the post-war era. We had, we had competitive parliamentary elections, mm -hmm. but not presidential elections. The, for the presidency, they would gather behind a person, uh, the different political groups, and support him just to make sure the country passes through the difficult phases. Then as we passed that post-war era, things began to open up. But in all those competitive elections, when there wasn't an incumbent, the incumbent has always won, understandably. But in all those elections, it was always an upset. So there was always a chance that there could be an upset this time around as well, because Mr. Racy had very two very outspoken opponents. Mm -hmm. One actually said, you're, you're uneducated. You don't even have a high school diploma and you know he was really nasty about uh, the way in which he spoke but you know he he was well ahead in the debates they couldn't touch him and uh, his the turnout was as expected in the polls and i did give the poll numbers to friends uh, because the one of the the most credible polling center would give me an other people, the polls. So some of my friends living abroad, they've received the poll, they'd received the poll. So it was unexpected for quite a large number of people. Mm -hmm. After each debate, we could see that there was no major shift or change. 
And as I said, I think the reason is because Mr. Raisi is seen as left-leaning and he, that he wants to expand the, the net to support the uh, you know, social welfare net, to support the people who've been left behind, and also because he's been seen as uh, an effective anti-corruption uh, head of the judiciary. Now, is he going to be a good president? I have no idea. But the point is that they couldn't uh, bring him down during the debates in the eyes of the public. And there was also local elections taking place in Iran, which were very important to people's daily lives, but of course were largely ignored in all this Western media coverage. Um, I saw, for example, that in one majority Kurdish town, which happens to be Sunni uh, in Iran's province of Western Azerbaijan, four women were elected to a seven member town council which I thought was interesting. So what can you tell us about the local elections in Iran that often get you know, brushed over in Western media? Well, even in the local elect elections, the moderates and the reformists were generally speaking wiped out. And as I said, it was because of the last eight years, maybe four years from now, things would be different. But yes, the local elections uh, have, um, have been held uh, simultaneously with the presidential election. And uh, we have many women in the different councils. In Tehran, we have a number, number of women sitting in the very powerful Tehran council. And in the major cities, Esfahan, Shiraz, elsewhere, women stand and, and get elected. Uh, so it's nothing strange here. But the thing is that the image of Iran is so negative that you know people abroad are shocked. Some, I, I've had, I would say, numerous cases where I would invite Western academics to Iran to teach from the United States, from, from England, uh, from the UK. And uh, when they'd come to the airport, they'd bring in a lot of canned food because they were, you know, with these very heavy bags and a lot of, I don't know, junk food and all that. And the reason was because they thought they, they would have a problem finding food in Iran. Oh. These are academics, you know, as if some, like, this is some starved country or war ravaged country. And these are academics from credible universities. Or often, you know, a person who you know by name, who I won't name, a really <laughs> decent person. We, as soon as he came, I was driving him from the airport. I was taking him from the airport and he was, he saw like women driving cars. And this was a long time ago, like 15, mm -hmm. 20, like uh, quite a long time ago. He was like looking at these drivers as if this is like something outrageous. You know, sorry, this isn't, you know, your ally not his ally, but this isn't your country's ally, Saudi Arabia. This is yeah. Iran, <laughs> right. you know, where we have women taxi drivers, where we have women pilots, where we have women uh, government ministers, where we have the minister of health in the past uh, during the Ahmadinejad administration for four years was uh, a woman. And that's a huge ministry. It's the second largest government ministry, which also includes the medical universities. Or and, and and the list goes on. Again, is the situation for women in I, in Iran ideal? Definitely not. Is it some utopia? Definitely not. It is. I, I don't think it is anywhere in the world. But Iran is not what uh, the Western media depicts it to be. And I personally think that when you look at the maximum pressure campaign, the fact that Iran is surrounded by American military bases, the fact that Western governments have all sorts of Persian media outlets that carry out psychological warfare against Iranians day and night. BBC Persian, Deutsche Welle Persian, BOA Persian with Western taxpayer money, and a host of other media outlets that are funded by the government or owned by different governments. Online, they have online armies, the MEK terrorist organization that fought for Saddam Hussein and carried out terrorist attacks in Iran, killing 17,000 people just through terrorist attacks. They have a, a camp in Albania and offices across Europe and North America, and they, are, they carry out online warfare 
they they are they are you know their Twitter and Facebook army. So while our accounts are getting deleted, my Facebook account has been deleted, my Instagram account has been deleted. Each of them have like 50, 60 different accounts, and they they wage war against Iran. So Iran has all this, yet the fact that you have elections in Iran that are meaningful, not ideal, that there the fact that you have debates in Iran. I think is impressive, whether my, you know, Western audience likes it or not. I think it's impressive, and the, and then let's compare it to the United States. There was allegedly uh, a Russian involvement in the U.S. election, which of course there is no proof for uh, to show that the Russians had anything to do with Trump's election. But there were four years of crisis in the United States and all sorts of sanctions imposed on Russia because of this uh, allegation. And, you know, I, I obviously the, the reason why they made the claim. Oh, you are muted. There you go. Yes, I think someone called. So sorry about that. No worries. So the, re so the reason why the claim was made was just to cover up for the humiliation that the, the the Democratic Party went through under the leadership of the extremely corrupt Hillary Clinton. But in any case, Russia was punished. For, we had, the United States had four years of crisis and uh, media, uh, Twitter accounts ultimately were shut down. People were removed from, uh, from the public sphere. You know, the, the accounts were. So when the United States allegedly has some sort of foreign involvement in its election, look at how it responds. Yet Iran, which is a smaller country, and the whole of the US alliance and its regional allies like Saudi Arabia and the Israeli regime and uh, others are taking part in this anti-Iranian media coalition and economic isolation and, uh, and military uh, strangulation or you know, surrounding Iran militarily. Yet Iran still has this degree of openness. So I think when we look at it from that perspective, uh, if one is to be fair, I would say that I would give I Iran a, a higher grade than the United States. That's a really good point. Um, and I want to get back to that because of the websites we mentioned that got shut down. But first, I wanted to ask you to uh, respond to this uh, Western narrative that's been making its way through various outlets. Uh, you know, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International recently called for Raisi to be investigated. They've accused him of involvement in these mass executions uh, back in 1988. Um, and it is true, I mean, many of the people who were executed were Mujahideen al Khalk, the MEK who had worked with Saddam and committed terror attacks in Iran. But then they also say that some of the people who were executed were Marxist opponents of the Shah, um, executed in revolutionary courts. So can you explain what that's about? Why do we keep hearing um, that Raisi was involved in these mass executions and who was it that was being executed and why? Right, well, first of all, they call them dissidents. So during World War II, those French men and women or British citizens or European and American citizens who were secretly fighting for the Germans, after they were arrested or discovered and executed, I don't know, would they call them dissidents? I mean, would the if the Western media would the Western media today call these people dissidents? The people who are executed, and then of course they inflate the number like thirty thousand people. You you hear you see all sorts of different numbers: fifty thousand, thirty thousand, ten thousand, which itself shows that it's a, you know a lot of this is just propaganda. But a significant number of people were executed. They were people who were convicted. They were a part of the. Uh, Mujahideen Nahal terrorist organization, which I experienced one terror attack. Uh, I was, it was in the morning, I was getting ready to go to school and uh, there was a huge explosion and all of our windows were broken. 
on the one side of our house. Uh, because on the two on two sides you have other buildings or no windows and then in the back I, I don't recall any windows being broken but in the front of the house where we enter and leave all the windows were shattered so I went and uh, to the place I left the house instead of going to school I went to place the place where the bomb exploded and nine or eleven people were killed oh. Four of them were an Armenian family, a, a husband and wife with their two kids, which apparently, I, from what I read in the newspaper, uh, they were going to, they were taking their kids to school. Uh, I don't remember if it was nine or 11. I'm sh I probably could find out if I looked, checked online, but that was just one small instance. 17,000 people in Iran died as a, uh, as, a, as a result of their terrorist attacks. Some of them, their terrorist attacks were suicide bombs. Some of them were uh, you know, torturing people to death using um, irons and all in, in, you know, the people who they captured and they take to their secret uh, uh, places where they, where, where they stay. Uh, they were, they were, they were like ISIS. They were, they were our ISIS. And worse, in my opinion, what was even worse was that they were fighting for Saddam Hussein. They were part of his army. They, they were based in Iraq. And they killed many three people, uh, you know, an unknown amount of people just through spying, espionage. And also when the Iraqi, when Saddam's forces, I should say Saddam's forces, because the Iraqi people were just victims of this Western backed regime. The Western governments gave Saddam Hussein chemical weapons. They gave him chem the military intelligence to use those chemical weapons. And they gave him political cover to get away with using those weapons. So whenever Westerners talk about chemical weapons, I get disgusted. Yeah. So because I, I survived two chemical attacks personally, and many didn't. I mean, many people are dying as we speak, but none of these people who are outraged about Syria do anything about, you know, their own leaders and their own politicians who are still alive. So it's, and we know that the OPCW, about the OPCW cover up and how Duma was not carried out by the Syrian government. But that aside, their false outrage or those who are outraged out of ignorance, the fact that they just ignore the fact that Saddam Hussein used infinitely more chemical weapons than anything that has ever been used anywhere on this planet yet no one does anything about it or claim, says anything about it, shows this is just hypocritical. These are just crocodile tears. But in any case, they were working for Saddam Hussein. And so when his army would attack you, uh, Iranian positions, the Mujahideen Khalq people, they would wear Iranian uniforms. They, they were Iranian. They'd go into, they'd infiltrate the Iranian side, pretend that they are on the Iranian side, and then, you know, uh, they would fool the Iranians and, and help uh, Saddam's forces massacre these troops. So how many Iranians did they actually kill? There's no way to calculate. And this terrorist organization was based in, in Europe as well, in Paris, uh, as it was fighting in Iraq for Saddam Hussein. So they were, they were not just traitors in the sense that they were fighting with, for Saddam Hussein, and carrying out terrorist attacks and, a part, and being a part of his army, but they're also working with Western countries as well simultaneously with Saddam Hussein to bring down the government in Iran. So these people, uh, people in Iran have no sympathy for them. And uh, in addition to that, this is not something that Mr. Raisi did. This is something that the judiciary did. Mm. And it was a decision in the judiciary. Now, if Westerners, are unhappy about this, then they should start calling those people in Europe who fought for mm -hmm. Hitler dissidents. That's a good point. I mean, I, I don't know how to, there's, I don't know what the argument against that would be, but I appreciate you explaining that because that's certainly something that we're not hearing in all of these accounts. Um, there is this theory that the Iranian leadership is seeking to make major changes maybe to transition to a parliamentary system from a presidential one. 
uh, perhaps to abandon having one supreme leader in favor of a council or other possible overhauls. And this might be why they wanted greater political unity and helped usher a conservative like Raisi to power. This is the theory. I'm not, and it's not my theory. Um, or that perhaps in order to have greater cohesion in advance of a new deal with the West, that's why they needed to raise. Does any of this make sense to you? No, it's nonsense. The thing is that these, these people who work in Western think tanks, first of all, they have to say what needs to be said and what is acceptable. Otherwise, they'll lose their jobs. And I know of people who have lost their jobs. Flint Leverett, who was in the White House, he was the head of the Middle East and the National Security Council. Uh, after he had left, he went to the New America Foundation. And then he started saying things about Iran that were not popular right. in the establishment. And he was, you know, thrown out. So, and you, you know as well as I, you know better than I, that people in the U.S. establishment, people in government are taken at, uh, care of afterwards. And his wife, who's Jewish, Hillary, uh, she also had critical views of the United States. She has critical views of the United States. And she was, she, you know, she, I think she, uh, she was educated at Harvard. She started teaching Middle Eastern studies at the university. And then, although she, for two years in a row, she was considered the best professor by the students at that school, she was uh, expelled ultimately. She, yeah, so, so these are people who worked in the White House. Yeah. Uh, Flint uh, resigned over the Iraq war, but they were in the National Security Council. These were, you know, heavyweights and, you know, completely expelled. So if you want to have a job at a good think tank or in, in media, then you're not going to say the sort of things that Rania says uh, <laughs> on her show. That's a fact. So... Uh, these people are going to say what needs to be said. Every now and then they have to be creative because they can't repeat the same thing over and over again. So they make up these fantasies. First of all, as I said earlier, if there was a, some sort of deep state uh, decision, Dr. Lari Jenny wouldn't have signed up to, to, to run for presidency in the first place. They would have just said, stay out of it, and he would have said, fine. Right. Then in the council, the Guardian Council, you wouldn't have had these internal divisions. You would have had unit you know a, a united front and they would all be saying you know one thing and then you wouldn't have had you know these you know the head of the central bank the head of the central bank they say is you know in the western media and these t think tank people say that he's an unknown well mr uh, rohani was an unknown mr ahmadinejad was an unknown and mr khatami was an unknown all three of them won as a result of the TV programs, because they all have, it's public TV, they all have e equal access. In the United States, you only have the Democratic and the Republican candidate on the stage. Uh, in Iran, all of them have access. I'm not saying, again, that Iran is ideal. I'm just saying that you know, their representation, that their, their narrative of Iran is, is not honest. Or no. so, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And so, so uh, Mr. Raisi, if he, if they wanted to usher him in, and then sometimes they say there's fraud in the Iranian elections. Well, if there's fraud in the Iranian elections, why didn't they just make the turnout at seventy percent? Why <laughs> That's not? That's a good point. Uh, why not just? Yeah, we if we if we need seventy percent, we'll make it seventy-two percent. <laughs> you know. Uh, so. It's it's not that there are so many holes in this narrative, or like they say, the 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 leader's son he's going to be the next leader or something. None of the leader's children are important political figures, and in fact, they're not even on Iranian television. People, if they see them, probably won't know them, his sons and daughters or son. Unlike in the U.S., home. where we have like Meghan unlike McCain in Western and countries, exactly. Chelsea Clinton and yeah, all these people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But they want to, uh, why? Because whether you like Ayatollah Khamenei or not, he's super clean. He doesn't have, I don't know, palaces. He doesn't have businesses. And his children are ordinary people with ordinary lifestyles. But that is something that, you know, these people can't tolerate. So his son is, has no role to play in the future, no significant role to play or any of his children. And uh, there's no sign of Iran changing the constitution. There's always talk about the, the system, 
whether this system is better or a parliamentary system is better, but there's no talk and there hasn't been any serious talk about any change because a change would need a constitutional council to sit down and write up a new constitution, bring about changes, and then you'd have to have a referendum. Mm -hmm. That, if, if they're going to move in that direction, that, that will take a lot of time and a lot of work, but there has been no talk in this regard. So, you know, this is just, uh, I think, uh, part of this broader narrative to sort of create this, and yeah, this, you know, this sense feeling that this is all some like uh, a staged and orchestrated uh, change in, in Iran. Whereas we just have a new president who, uh, who's replaced a, a, an unpopular president. And we'll have to see how he, uh, how well he does. And he doesn't, and, and some say that they, they, they want to make him the next leader. First of all, the Ayatollah Khamenei is, is very healthy as we speak. And he regularly speaks and there's no sign of any ill health. Second of all, if let's assume they want Mr. Raisi to be the next leader, why would he need to be the president? He's the head of the judiciary. There's no need for him to be the president. In fact, being a president makes him vulnerable because you know, he'll have to deal with the sanctions and all the difficulties that people are, are facing. So it would actually be detrimental to him becoming the leader under these tough circumstances. So again, these arguments are so inconsistent, but in, in, in Western countries, anything that you say negative about Iran sounds reasonable. Right. So, um, so they're, they're left unquestioned, even though often they're inconsistent, as I, as I pointed out. You know, just like when they say uh, the, the Iranian regime, you know, they like to use the word regime. Uh, whenever you hear the regime, you know they're angry or they just... <laughs> so uh, the Iranian regime is unpopular, it is corrupt, it is, it, you know, people despise it, it is incompetent, it's incapable of governing. But then again, uh, at the same time, they say it's a rising threat to the world. The world is being threatened by this, the growing menace of the regime. How can these two happen at the same time if it's falling apart and it's collapsing and it's incompetent how can it be a growing threat you can't have both at the same time but you know the narrative since both these of these inconsistent narratives are negative they both sound right yeah you know well that yeah they're bad and that shows yeah that's bad too so you know these two bad things they work together <laughs> That's a really good point. Or I like that Iran is constantly weak and collapsing and its people hate it. But uh, at the same time, it's like a threat to the, it's a menace to the entire world and it's everywhere. And it's everyone else world. hates it too. Right. The Iraqis hate it. Everyone yeah, hates everyone. Iran. It's just like meddling in every country. <laughs> but there, it's a growing threat, you know, well, come on. <laughs> <laughs> So you've you've mentioned this a little bit, but I want you to, to elaborate a bit on this. Um, the issue of the Western and Saudi-backed media apparatus that is that exists in Iran that isn't shut down in Iran, despite the fact that, of course, we talked about earlier, the U.S. has seized and shut down these thirty-six websites, many of them Iranian, um, including Press TV. Um, the notice it's interesting that appears on if you try to go to Press TV or any of these other websites, you'll see a notice. Uh, from the US government that says the website has been seized as part of a law enforcement action by the Bureau of Industry and Security and the FBI. Um, and so the US is arguing that these websites are linked to Iranian disinformation. So I, I, I'd love for you to explain to our listeners and viewers the level of US government, Western government, and even Saudi government funded explicitly funded propaganda that Iranians are constantly exposed to that aren't shut down in Iran, just because the irony First, of this is interesting. Well, they can't shut it down. It's satellite, you know, satellite TV. It's, you know, let, let me give an example. BBC Persian, as well as the others, it is anti-Arab. You have guests who go on who are constantly, you know, we are Muslim, we're, we're Iranian, these Arabs, this or that, and these, many of these channels. The, the language that you often see on these Western funded channels, if you remove, if you translated it into English, 
and you exchange some of the words used African American or Black or Hispanic or, or, or Latino or something in it in its place, you'd have riots in the United States. Wow. You'd have riots, but they can use a language that is racist, that is anti-Muslim uh, in some of these channels, anti-Muslim, hostile. And that, that aside, you also have this uh, constant attempt to demoralize the public. So when the, for one example is when the coronavirus broke out, these channels were all creating this dark picture of Iran. People are dying on the streets and they show these uh, clips of like someone, dead people on the streets and, and you know, no one could verify them. Sometimes the Iranian public TV would go send a team and they'd find out that it was fake or staged or, or whatever. But they were trying to, and, and then this continued as things in, in Britain were really bad. So BBC Persian, for example, was saying, you know, pretending as if the situation in England is okay and fine, even as the British prime minister was dying, literally in hospital, but it was saying, you know, you Iranians, you're miserable. You know, you, you're, you know, one of the deputy health ministers got the coronavirus and they were ridiculing Iran day and night for this. And also, you know, saying how bad it is. The prime minister was on literally on his deathbed. <laughs> but here they were in Persian, they were ridiculing. So BBC English was trying to keep people uh, calm. BBC Persian was trying to keep people in fear. Wow. Or, or, or Iran International, which is a Saudi channel, these Iranian mercenaries who work in these different channels, the ones who work in uh, the Iran Saudi channel are like the ultimate mercenaries. Like they're, they, they've been talking about how these elections are undemocratic, they're unfair, this is just a facade. You're using Saudi money to say Iran is not democratic. You are working <laughs> right. for the Saudis. You are being paid by Mohammed bin Salman on Iran International. I mean, the, the irony of it all. So, you know, this huge, and then online, you have these online armies that uh, people whose job it is day and night to, to uh, you know, create, you know, uh, and use bots as well to create these campaigns or this, this sense that everyone is opposed to to the, the, the Islamic Republic of Iran. And as I said, while we are all being removed from the internet, I, I've lost my Facebook account, I've, I've lost my Instagram account, and now we have all these websites in Iran. The Americans just want to, they, they want to, not, not only do they want to strangle Iranians, not only are they killing Iranians through sanctions, not only are they threatening Iran with their military bases and the killing of the Iranian senior officials, and constantly saying all options are on the table, but they're also trying to silence Iran and silence dissent. And the uh, interesting thing is that no one is outraged. No one in the New York Times is going to say these are crimes against humanity and this is censorship. It's all fine. Uh, just like in Yemen, right now the Americans are actually becoming more involved in Yemen. There are American drones that have been downed over the past few days. So Americans are more active in gathering intelligence for the Saudis in the last few days than before. Uh, we have British, um, uh, th apparently thousands of British advisors helping the Saudis and especially their air force uh, to massacre the people of Yemen. And they've also shut down websites supporting the Yemeni government, the government in Sana'a that is fighting the Saudis. And so, you know, on the one hand, genocide is carried out in Yemen. They want to silence those who are supporting Yemen. They attempt genocide against the Iranians through these sanctions, uh, and they shut down Iranian websites. If Iran has nothing to offer, if we are so irrational, if we're so uh, unpopular, if Iran is so despised, if it's so clear for the world how bad Iran is, then why silence these websites, these voices, which, you know, Google doesn't even allow through their algorithms to, to 
you know, for people to, if you Google Iran, you're not going to get, you're going to get basically uh, Western sources that right. come up uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and even in part Persian, if you Google uh, Iran, you'll, you'll get the Western, uh, you know, BBC and all these Western outlets rather than Iranian outlets more or less at the top. So, you know, they've already diminished people's ability to access Iran. All of the Iranian channels are already sanctioned. You don't find them on satellite TV. They've all been removed. And so the same is true with the resistance uh, media uh, across the region. So they've been removed from the internet. They're, uh, they've been removed from Facebook. Uh, they've been, you know, they're, they're, they're restricted on Google and on search engines. And now they've just taken away their websites. They just can't tolerate dissent. And I think that just shows how vulnerable the United States and its European allies feel they are and how this crumbling empire is just lashing out. But what, what surprises me is the extent to which Western media elites and journalists are completely silent about all this. Yeah, <laughs> they're not exactly signing petitions about censorship or cancel culture when it comes to this sort of stuff. Um, I wanna move to the issue of sanctions for a moment. Um, I'm curious from your perspective, how is the Iranian economy doing? Has it become more resilient due to the sanctions, more independent? Is it forging stronger links with countries like China or other countries um, that you know mean it's maybe developing an immunity to sanctions that other countries like Iraq in the past or Syria and Venezuela today failed to achieve? And is there an argument for ignoring Western sanctions and maybe not offering any concessions given the recent improvements in the economy? Well, uh, uh, everything that you said is correct. Uh, the, the economy is doing better now, although it's still very tough. Yeah, it's it's a tough situation for ordinary Iranians, especially the more vulnerable. That's the objective of these sanctions. And of course, the irony is that they they say, oh, incompetence and corruption, as if you know they're trying it. And I think these Western journalists say this because. They want to sleep well at night. Hmm. They don't want to feel guilty of the fact that they are silent in the face of, you know, this sort of genocide, these this genocidal policy. Uh, you know, all countries have corruption and incompetence. Uh, the United States, I think, we were learning more and more about it as, you know, in in recent years. But actually, sanctions create more corruption. Why? Because and incompetence. Why? Because when you have sanctions, people are impoverished so more have to steal or feel the need to steal or when you cannot use the banking sector and monitor e everything easily to import necessary goods they have to do it through middlemen and then you there's more corruption it's uh, it's um you know it's, it's, uh, the checks and balances that nor normally exist and the procedures that exist to monitor the transfer of funds and goods and so on are disrupted. So you, you have more opportunity to steal when, when there's a shortage of something like medicine, then there's an incentive for people to take, you know, steal and then take it to the black market. Right. So, you know, the sanctions create corruption. So that the objective is to harm people and those who try to hide this they are they're complicit they're just as they're part of the war against ordinary civilians but um the economy is doing better because iran is gradually becoming more self-sufficient in certain areas although this year we have a major drought um and that's going to hurt uh, especially in the coming months uh, Iran is moving toward, and, and so are other countries moving closer to Iran because countries like Russia and China are also being pressured and sanctioned. So there's a convergence of interest between these three countries. But Iran is moving, and especially under Asia, I think Iran is going to move closer to the global south, East Asia, Central Asia, neighboring countries, Russia, China, and so on, but also try to rely more on its own resources. So I think Iran is going to... Uh, focus less on Europe and the United States. And the Americans and the Europeans are responsible for this because their sanctions, their, uh, their abuse, abusive behavior, their uh, attempts to silence Iran 
uh, and the Iranian media and the individuals. All of this only encourage Iran to look for new friends and new allies and new people to work with and cooperate with. So this is a this is a direct result of their own policies. And of course, Iran is trying to help countries while it is suffering. And yeah. this is something really commendable. Iran, when the Europeans and the Americans try to strangle the people of Syria, there was no fuel in Syria two, three months ago. People, you know, people, people were, you need fuel to survive, but they are so vicious, these Western regimes. They are so unbelievably vicious. So the Iranians would send fuel to Syria and sometimes they'd be attacked by the Israeli regime or the, or the Europeans would confiscate them or, or try to confiscate the Iranian ships. So, but the Iranians would send, send fuel to Syria to help ordinary people live and survive. And they send fuel and supplies to Venezuela to help the ordinary people who are being strangled uh, there survive too. So uh, while Iran is struggling, and it is making progress, people are still suffering. Uh, and uh, at the same time, Iran is trying to support other nations like the people of Yemen who are undergoing genocide and Western uh, supported genocide, Syrians who've been struggling through a Western dirty war with, along with Mr. Erdogan and Netanyahu and you know the Saudis and uh, now the, the the, the, the monstrous sanctions, Venezuela, Cuba, and so on. So uh, I, I think that Iran's role is a very positive role uh, in the world that we live in today. And I'm very proud of what Iran does. But does that mean that I think everything that Iran does is right? No. But you know, sometimes people ask me, why is it that you always support Iran? Why don't you ever criticize Iran? Well, if the BBC gives me a talk show, <laughs> uh, I promise you I'll criticize Iran for 15 minutes and then uh, I'll, I'll attack the United States for 45 minutes if it's a one hour show but, or, or <laughs> Iran's fair. opponents. But if they give, you know, every few months, some Western media outlet gives, gives me five minutes to talk, I'm not going to badmouth Iran, no. Uh, when Western countries are committing war crimes and crimes against humanity, uh, uh, regularly, there is no comparison between Iran and them. So I will defend Iran just as I will defend Venezuela and just how, as I will defend all these countries who are being um, targeted by this uh, very evil empire. So it also seems like the sanctions um, have, I guess, I mean, that this is normal. The sanctions have most affected I, maybe not most affected is the right way, but have affected the middle class who often look towards the West and who would have been the West's allies. Um, does the fact that this class has been weakened by sanctions mean the West has less tools in Iran that it can use to achieve its goals? Well, I wouldn't say the middle class is pro-Western. I'd say the upper middle class and the mm. upper classes and, and they, that they are usually, there's a, a stronger pro-Western tendency among them. Yes, and some of them are very pro-Western. But I think that in general, that people in Iran have been, the, the overwhelming majority of people in Iran have been critical. But ever since the United States began using these extremist policies of uh, of trying to make people suffer as much as possible. Uh, the United States has become more unpopular and especially under Trump because the, you know, how the, the degree to which he pushed this policy and the crude way in which he behaved and the murder of General Soleimani who basically led the war against ISIS. ISIS that the Americans helped create through their despicable policies. We know from, for example, as you know very well, uh, Jake Sullivan in an email that WikiLeaks revealed in February 2012 that Al Qaeda is on the side of the United States and Syria, and of course ISIS came out of Al, Al Qaeda. And there's a lot of other evidence. So I don't want to take up your time with this. So General Soleimani, who was murdered by uh, the uh, Americans along with his Iraqi counterpart, and and so on. Um, you know, th this sort of thing and the sanctions directed at ordinary people, people die because they can't find their medicine or, you know, especially expensive cancer patient, uh, uh, you know, cancer medicine for cancer patients 
uh, sometimes can't be found. So people die. Or, you know, because of the, the war on uh, the economic war, people's wages collapse and therefore they can't find or they can't pay for medicine mm. or they can't, you know, families fall apart because of the economic problems. And this is the objective of, of European governments, these uh, very sophisticated uh, European uh, politicians who go to operas and and things like that. They they are. This is what they do. This is their objective: to make people suffer, to kill people. Whether it's they're Iranians, whether they're Venezuelans, whether they're Cubans, whether they're, it doesn't matter. Whether they're Libyans, whether they're Syrians, uh, their objective is control and uh, to maintain their grip on power and keep Western domination. And they are part of that apparatus. And so is the Western mainstream Western media. So, and, and these elites, they're all a part of this broad, uh, you know, coalition of entities that, uh, you know, carry these, these out and legitimize it through silence. You know, I'm curious, um can one make the argument that Iran is in a way stronger than ever? And I'm not talking about the economy even here. I'm talking about with the resistance action, axis in which Iran has been you know, playing a leading role. The resistance axis with Iran in the lead, would you say that's stronger than ever? Because, you know, when I look Without at the Middle a East, doubt. Well, when I look at the Middle East now, I, you know, we have these millions of mobilized people. And I mean, from Lebanon to Syria, to Iraq, to Iran, to Yemen and Palestine, all connected, cooperating, feeling this kind of solidarity. And this is as sanctions have right. been expanded and during the, so the Americans were saying, and that's why this term proxy is so such nonsense. Mm -hmm. They use the term proxy basically to delegitimize them, whereas they are popular forces. And the reason why you can see that they're popular is because of the sanctions. So the Americans were saying, if we strangle the Iranians, they will no longer be to be able to fund their so-called proxies. And so they would all fall apart. But over the past few years with these maximum pressure sanctions, we've seen the resistance in Yemen, the Yemeni government defeat the Saudis. We've seen uh, across the region, these groups and these, uh, these allies of Iran, as you've pointed out, grow stronger. Why is it that they grow stronger if there's no money and they're, they're able to strangle women and children in Iran and prevent them from helping them? Why are they growing stronger? stronger? Because they all have motivation. Mm. They're allies. They're anti-imperialists. They want the Western domination to end and they want corrupt people who are funded by uh, these Western regimes to get off their backs. That's basically it. And no matter what the Americans are, attempt to do, they're destined to fail. And their at regional allies will not last unless they change their policy. Saudi Arabia cannot continue to go down this road without becoming unstable. And the same is true with other pro-Western dictatorships in this region. They support the dictatorships in this region, but they call these popular groups proxies. And by the way, one thing that I should point out is that Iran, Iran's relationship with these groups is very different from American and Saudi relations. The Americans dictate terms to people. The people who they support, they dictate terms. They say, this has to be the prime minister. This has to be done. This has to be, you have, they tell them what has to be done. The Saudis do the same, the others do the same. But you know, as well as I, Iran does not tell Hezbollah what to do. Hezbollah has just as much influence over Iran as Iran has. They are allies, they are friends. The same is true with Iran's allies in Iraq. Iran doesn't tell anyone what to do. They have similar worldviews. They want independence from this, these ugly regimes that impose cruel and brutal sanctions that support apartheid, that support extremists that come from the, the Wahhabi school of thought funded by Saudi Arabia and others. They, they want freedom from you know, th this, this Western dystopia uh, that has been uh, created uh, across our region. In Libya, I mean, Iran has nothing to do with Libya, but we see that in Libya, 
the uh, NATO has destroyed a country, a country that was the most advanced in the whole of Africa. They were more well, they were, uh, people were more wealthy, they had health care, they had schools, they destroyed the country. So, you know, or, or in Latin, the, what we see in Latin America is very similar to what we see in, in this part of the world. It's not just Muslims, it's, not, it's the global south. It's, mm -hmm. And these people want the Americans to go away. And the irony is, is that if the Americans had behaved normally, many of these groups would have been friendly to the United States. If the Saudis had spent 1% of the money that they've spent waging war against the people of Yemen and carrying out genocide, just to build in Yemen, the, uh, the Houthis, as they like to call them, Ansar Allah, and what is now the Yemeni government, basically, they would have been friends of Saudi Arabia. But the Saudis chose to destroy their reserves and the future does not look good for Saudi Arabia <laughs> instead of just cooperating with the government in Yemen. So, you know, the, the Americans and their allies are, are the, they are more, uh, let's say, responsible for the decline of their empire than anyone else. Their own policies are what is bringing about the destruction of this empire. At a time when uh, countries like China are on the rise, the Americans continue to waste trillions of dollars to, you know, to crush dissent, and, and they're not going to succeed. And then I'm curious, Mohammed, can Iran do more to help allies like Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon? And let me explain what I mean by that, because, you know, these states, they're so weak and their economies are suffering due to sanctions and war, but also due to governments and political classes that liberalize their economies. They conceded, I think, too much to capitalism. Um, and that led to some corruption and, you know, that made it more difficult to develop. So is there an Iranian model, do you think, for development and building a resilient state that elevates its people that maybe these countries can replicate? Well, I think Iran has also conceded too much to capitalism. That's why we, we see this reaction now in Iran and why there's, you know, people voted for Mr. Raisi and why there has been a lot of apathy because of the very same forces that have brought about greater, a greater gap between rich and poor in this country. I don't know what more Iran can do to help its allies, but I think that it's almost inevitable that the United States will fail in this region. And I think that the coming months and the next couple of years will see enormous change. I don't think that this, um, uh, this current order will sustain itself. And even the war in Gaza, I think, is a, is a major sign that things are changing. The war in Gaza showed Iran, first of all, to be the only, per, the only country really supporting the Palestinians. The rest are just talking. Mean, when we look at Mr. Erdogan, uh, all he does is talk. But he has economic relations with the Israelis. He has political relations with the Israelis. He have, they have direct flights. It's, it's just you know propaganda. Uh, just to promote himself. But, you know, Iran's support for the Palestinians has shown that the Israelis, they sh it's shown the Israeli regime to be very weak, the apartheid regime, because it's, it was a major intellig intelligence failure, the fact that they did not know of Palestinian capabilities. It was a major victory for the Palestinians, despite the brut brutal onslaught against women and children in Gaza. But the fact that the regime was not able to enter Gaza, they didn't dare enter Gaza, the fact that the so-called Iron Dome was uh, penetrated so easily by n nothing near the sort of weapons that Hezbollah and others have because of the nature of Gaza being surrounded. You know, so a poor and impoverished and isolated and abused people uh, have, sh have really humiliated the Israelis. Despite, and, and of course, in the eyes of the public, the global public, the, the regime, the Israeli regime has shown itself for what it is by bringing down tower after tower after tower, including a tower full of media companies. And then, you know, the AP not only did it, the Associated Press not only did it, did it not condemn them or none of the Western media did it condemn the Israelis, but 
couple of weeks later, a young Jewish woman who supported the Palestinian people was expelled from the Associated Press. So, you know, this, 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 you know, Western dystopia uh, that we that we have that that's been created, this Western inspired dystopia. Uh, I think it's it's not sustainable, and I'm not saying that the, the map will completely change, but I think in the coming months and the next couple of years, it will change considerably in this part of the world. You know, you actually reminded me, I'm, I'm talking to you from Beirut, Lebanon, and Lebanon has this fuel crisis, and Iran actually offered to basically, so Lebanon's currency, I'm sure you know, like it's lost a crazy amount of value, it's pretty much worthless, and um, Iran offered to essentially just give Lebanon fuel, almost for free, they were like, you can, you don't have to pay us in dollars, you can pay us in lira, your local currency, um, and Le the Lebanese political system is very split. Half of it is like pro-resistance, pro-Hezbollah, pro-Iran. The other half is basically like a bunch of American puppets. And because of the American puppet half, Lebanon can't accept fuel from Iran, despite its desperation. Right. I mean, there's no electricity That's here. Right. Unless you have a generator, you go without electricity for most of the day. There's, I think, between three to six hours, on a good day, six hours, of state electricity because of the lack of fuel in this country cars can't get gasoline there's like an artificial and some areas shortage. don't get that much state electricity right some areas are getting maybe an hour a day if they're lucky um it's i mean it's so horrible and so it's just been it's, i mean it just shows you the level of you know you were talking about the way that america dicks dictates things it's it sometimes it doesn't even have to dictate it just has these pro-western puppets who will do that bidding without even being asked to They'll immediately and of, become an and of course, the crisis was created by a combination of the corruption of those puppets yes. and U.S. sanctions against the Lebanese people to to force the people of Lebanon to kneel, just right. like in Syria, just like in and Iraq. And there are people. And like what's in, amazing, what's what's amazing is there are people here who will literally say, "I would rather have no electricity in the middle of the summertime and no AC than accept help from Iran." That is an attitude. That is an attitude. I mean, that, that goes back to like this propaganda, the level, like the Saudi funded, UAE funded, Western funded narrative. Brainwashes Whereas people. the people who they look to will give them nothing. Uh, but yeah, yeah. And then, but they're okay. But like that, that's not even their, their primary issue is <sighs> I don't want Iranian oil. So it's like it, we had, there was this crit, this deal that was made with Iraq where Iraq is basically like giving Lebanon a handout of fuel uh, so that Lebanon doesn't accept it from Iran, but the Iraqi fuel isn't even the kind of fuel that Lebanon can use. I mean, it's just a mess, but just- And that Iraqi <laughs> fuel is only being given that limited amount of Iraqi fuel because the Americans told them to give right. that limited amount of fuel to prevent Iranian fuel from being accepted in Lebanon. Yes, I mean, these you have colonized minds in Iran as well. You have a segment of the elites, the rich people, and especially the north of Tehran, who are, who, who are fine with sanctions. And a lot of them make money off of these sanctions. They're very pro-American. They're very anti-Iran, like in Venezuela, like elsewhere. Right. But, uh, you know, these are colonized minds and they will, you know, in, in some cases in Lebanon, some of them will suffer. In some cases, they will benefit, but you will always have these, you know, orientalized orientals or these brown sahibs or these, you know, these, just, these colonized minds where they will just look to Western countries and, and obey. Um, no, that's a very good point. And I lastly, you know, I, I know I've kept you for a very long time and I do appreciate your time. I just, I know you recently returned from a trip to Syria. Um, so I was curious if you could give us like an update about what you saw there. Um, you know, the, obviously this, this war that Syria, this existential war against these U.S. and Saudi and Turkish backed uh, genocidal Wahhabi jihadis, whatever you want to call them, that tried to collapse the state for the purposes of regime change for the last decade, that project in Syria failed. So now there's this um, increasing reliance on using these sanctions to really strangle and almost punish Syria. So now, you know, you were talking about how people who need fuel to survive. I know that Syria people really lack fuel. 
um, way more than in Lebanon. And it's a pretty dire situation. So can you give us an idea of the situation you saw on the ground there during your recent trip? Yeah. And, and I don't want to discredit your friend Aaron Mate further. <laughs> Uh, but I Aaron. met him there, so I you know, now they, now they can say that he's also linked to the Iranian regime and the Mullahs. And you heard I'm it on this show. You heard it on yeah, Breakthrough you heard News. It. Exactly. But there's an Iranian Aaron link. Aaron Mate that, caught, exposed. Yeah. There's a link that I'm revealing for the first time. <laughs> Exclusive. But, that's what, that's how we'll that's how we'll package this uh this interview. Exclusive yeah, Aaron exactly. Mate exposed and, and, as the Iranian regime asset. And I can't go any further, but you know, there's a lot to say. <laughs> anyway, what I actually told him in Syria was that, you know, I've been to Syria a lot. I, ever since the, the dirty war began, I, I've constantly gone to Syria. And I've taught at universities or I've lectured at universities in different cities and, you know, um, We've had we've been fired at a, a you know um, a shell uh, you know hit literally a couple of a hundred or two meters away from where where I was standing in Damascus City a uh, shell landed you know in the city where and two people died there one or two I'm I'm not sure one died and the other one was bad look was badly injured injured when they were sort of dragging him to a car to take him to a hospital so I don't know if the second person died but. During the years, I've seen a lot of terrible things in Syria. But the interesting thing was that over the years of the dirty war, the Syrian currency was somewhat stable. Right. And the reason was because so much money was being brought into Syria by you know, money from the Persian Gulf, these Arab dictatorships, from Turkey, from Western, uh, from Western sources, that the Syrian currency was stable because of all this, these dollars injected into the country. But after ISIS and Al Qaeda and the other Western uh, aided terrorist organizations, Jaish al Islam, Ahrar al Sham, and you know all these, after they they failed, the economy and people in Syria were you know really happy. The economy collapsed because. Mm-hmm. Uh, forget the money that was coming in. Uh, the money was coming in af- as city after city was being destroyed by these groups. So you, you should see the, per- the Syrian currency collapse. But as I said, all this money was coming in. But then after the war, more or less to a large degree ended, even though Al-Qaeda still holds a province thanks to Mr. Erdogan and thanks to Western support for Al-Qaeda. And now we see that um, uh, PBS and there, there's an attempt to uh, rehabilitate Al Qaeda right. uh, in Syria through the you know frontline documentary and so on. But uh, but now you see the collapse because Western governments, having failed to destroy Syria through their proxies, now they want to get revenge on the Syrian people through sanctions. So the economic situation now is worse for ordinary people than when uh, ISIS was literally hundreds of meters away or a couple of kilometers away from where I was staying in Syria in, in in, in the buildings that I was sleeping at nights in Syria three, four, five years ago. Yeah. So when when ISIS and Al Qaeda and other groups had taken parts of Damascus, major parts of Damascus city, the economic situation for the people in Damascus in the government held areas was better than what it is now that now that all these places have been liberated because the Europeans and the Americans are trying to strangle people. They're trying to make them suffer. They want to kill as many women and children and innocent people as possible to bring down the state so that they can get their way. It's 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 revenge in this most disgusting, but you know, it's not it's not unique to Syria. Look at what's happening in Yemen. Even as uh, the war, the dirty war in Syria was being carried out, and they knew it was a dirty war. Everyone knew it was a dirty war. They were hiding yeah. it. And you know, when in 2011, uh, a senior, a former um, uh, Western intelligence officer that I knew in Beirut, you know who he is. I won't name him. Uh, he he turned sort of critical, very critical, 
but he told me that this is a dirty war, that this is a regime change operation. I said, how do you know? Uh, and he said, because all the people who I had been cooperating with and who I knew in Afghanistan and Pakistan are now in Istanbul. <laughs> so do you think that these Western reporters based in Istanbul don't, didn't know this? The, and you had that uh, Serene Ishim for Press TV, the Iranian TV channel, whose website has now been taken down by the FBI. Serene Ishim gave live reports on the Turkish-Syrian border, and she was saying World uh, Food Organization trucks, you know, affiliated to the UN, were taking in ammunition and troops for ISIS from, with the support of Turkish intelligence into Syria. These trucks were being used, so the UN were in on it. And she was a reporter and she was a, a Lebanese American like yourself. I, I knew her. She was 39 years old, she had two kids. And then uh, subsequently she gave another report on the border saying that Turkish intelligence, they say, I'm a spy, I'm, I'm really scared. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm just reporting the news. Hours later, she died in a mysterious car accident. She was murdered, obviously, in my opinion. But did Anybody anyone investigate? Is, is did any of those it. journalists based in uh, in Istanbul, who are still some of them still based there, say anything? Did they no. pursue this? Did the U.S. government pursue? No, silence. They just accepted this that she died in like a car accident or something. Yeah, and and you know the it, the and the car accident and the the, the truck driver. I mean, it's a it's a really weird story. It's obvious that they're, they're no. Know, it certainly trouble. deserves more investigation and scrutiny than it received. And then yeah. now, if um. If anybody and questions- And forget the murder, murder aside or the death aside, let's not investigate it. She was reporting on the border that UN trucks were being used by ISIS. Everyone knew this, but no one was reporting it because back then the, the you know, ISIS had to be strengthened. Right. And we know from Kerry's leaked audio uh, that he said that, you know, we allowed ISIS to advance on Damascus to put pressure on Assad. Yep. We, we watched them advance on this and, you know, Al-Qaeda and the other groups, which are not all that different from ISIS. So, you know, the Iranians are, have, have, and, the, you know, the Iranians actually, and Hezbollah actually entered the fight in 2013, Hezbollah first, only after two years when tens of thousands of foreign fighters were brought into the country, many of them from Europe and Western intelligence agencies allowed them to travel to Turkey. They knew that they were coming from mosques funded by Saudi Arabia and other such countries and that they were being radicalized. They knew it and they allowed it to happen because they wanted them to go to Turkey and then to Syria. Right. And, uh, you know, from Northern African countries. And only after tens of thousands of these uh, extremists were in already in Syria, did Hezbollah go in, did Iran go in to prevent the country from collapsing, Syria and Iraq from collapsing and falling into the hands of these extremists. So, you know, and, and of course, everything is reverse in the Western media. So Assad is butchering his own people, not, not Erdogan, not Netanyahu, who was also supporting these groups on the board, not the United States, who was leading this dirty war from Istanbul and also from Jordan. No, they didn't butcher, butcher Iran, uh, Syrians. But the reality is that the real butchers of Syria are these Western regimes and their local allies who butcher, butchered the country. There would not have been a dirty war if they had not uh, you know, b turned this into a military conflict by bringing in these extremists or facilitating their movement into Syria and Iraq and giving them the weapons they needed to carry out the, their, their destruction. They are the real butchers, but they use Assad because they want to deflect attention away from the reality, just like Duma. You know, they, when they talk about chemical attacks and how Assad is gassing his own people. Well, we know from Aaron Mate's work and the work of others what, ha what really happened in Duma. And we know what happened to the OPCW whistleblowers that no one is going to report in the West. But uh, let us pretend that these, and all the, the, and these, not, these chemical attacks were all carried out when the Syrian government was winning battles, as if the Syrian government wanted suddenly the Americans to start bombing them as they were winning. Uh, it, it makes no sense at all anyway. Those people who pretend that it's the case, they know they're lying, except for the utterly ignorant. But all these attacks, these alleged chemical attacks or chemical attacks combined, let's say they, let's pretend they were done by the Syrian government. They are nothing, nothing compared to the chemical attacks Saddam Hussein carried out for years 
against the Iranians and against his own people. And that those was people armed who were by, behind and that was him, armed by the U.S. and the West. Armed by the U.S., weapons, by, by the, the Germans, US. by the Europeans. Not only did they give them chemical weapons, they gave them military intelligence to use those chemical weapons and they gave them political cover to get away from it. And the United States even attempted to blame Iran for Iraq's chemical attacks. <laughs> there, you know, there, there are documents showing the, this, how the, the State Department was uh, telling people to you know, try to put, pin the blame on Iran. So, which is itself, a, I think, a dirty crime. But the point is that if these people are sincere, then, why don't they represent people like me in court who survived chemical attacks? Why didn't they come and talk to those Iranians who are dying as we speak, as we see a slow death of 30 years, 30 some years, suffering, being unable to breathe as we speak. Those thousands of people who, who've died over the years and the other thousands of people, many thousands who died during the immediate aftermath of the attacks on the many thousands of Kurds and others. I went to Halabche soon after the attack. 6,000 some people were killed. I, got, I went there after their bodies were removed. The 6,000, 6,500 6, people who were massacred. All I saw though were these cats, you know, who were blinded and in any case, in any case, forget it. Sorry, it's you just caught good. me with the electricity. <laughs> it always happens. Yes. Everyone who's you getting yeah. used to my program gets used to the electricity cutting out at least once. There it is. It'll come back. Ah, it's back. <laughs> Jeez, the reality the of uh, living in a Middle East uh, being uh, assisted by America is what that's what this looks like. Uh, Mohammed Mirandi, thank you so much for giving us so much of your time. Professor of thank English Literature and Orientalism at the University of Tehran. Um, th thank you. I appreciate you breaking all this down for us. People, of course, can follow you right on Twitter at for the time being yeah on the Twitter for the time being no longer have a facebook page um because for the crime of being iranian uh or instagram thank you or instagram right but thank you so so much for joining us today thank you for having me